Dr. Asper is um, uh, also joining us. Uh, so we are here to talk to you about uh, COVID-19, uh, specifically about vaccinations and boosters. Uh, we were asked to come by and we wanna thank uh, Intrepid and Dark Blade uh, for having us so we can uh, talk to you about uh, this important topic. Uh, so as a brief introduction, uh, Dr. Asper and I are infectious disease uh, physicians. Um, we're board certified and uh, we uh, started this company called Capsid uh, Consulting to help uh, businesses, schools, as well as uh, facilities with infection control. Uh, we also take care of uh, patients uh, as well. Um, we do have uh, um, certified uh, infection control nurses. So combined, we have over 50 years of experience, including some work at the WHO and the NIH. Um, so that's who we are um, and what we do. So, uh, and I also want to mention, I posted it in the chat room, um, but if anyone has any questions that uh, come up during uh, the presentation, feel free uh, to post it in the chat room uh, and then we'll get read it at the end of the presentation and then try to uh, answer it. Um, so uh, if you have the ability, feel free to uh, um, ask the questions in the chat room. So when we give these uh, talks, I kind of like to start um, with the state of the uh, pandemic uh, to try to give a a global view as to where we are and what's been uh, going on. So globally, this is the most uh, recent map uh, updated uh, yesterday, uh, just showing you the hotspots throughout the world of uh, COVID-19. Uh, as you can see, uh, pretty much everywhere, <laughs> it's been raging. Uh, and uh, if you look at the exact numbers, there have been 383 million total cases uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. In the last 28 days alone, there have been uh, slightly over 86 million cases. In terms of total deaths, there have been uh, above 5.6 million deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. And in the last 28 days, it's been uh, roughly 230,000. So this is globally. But what's going on here in the US, as you can see, pretty much the entire country uh, is red. And here in the US, we've had 75 uh, million cases since the beginning of the pandemic. And um, over the last 28 days, there have been uh, 18 million cases. In terms of deaths, there have been uh, close to 900,000 deaths. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, this here is the chart uh, that you can follow uh, increasing throughout time. Uh, and in the last 28 days, there have been 58,000 deaths. Unfortunately, this is something that we lead the world in in terms of uh, cases and deaths of COVID-19. However, uh, the good news is there are three vaccines that are available uh, to us in the United States, uh, as well as the world. And then there are some other uh, vaccines available throughout the world that I'm not really going to uh, talk much about since they're not licensed here in the United States. So here we have the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, two-dose vaccine uh, as the primary series. And there have been 119 million uh, people who've received it. And then you have Moderna, also two dose, 74 million have received that. Uh, both of them are now FDA approved. So before, when they first came out, they were under emergency use authorization, but uh, Pfizer received FDA approval several months ago, and then Moderna just uh, received it. And then there's the J&J Janssen uh, single dose vaccine, uh, 16 million have been uh, given out here in the States. So if you're looking at uh, people that are fully vaccinated, so fully vaccinated 
for for this purpose is two doses of the Pfizer, two doses of the Moderna, and one dose of the J and J. Terminology is changing to say, you know, are you up to date with your vaccine? So that's including the booster dose, and we'll get to that later in the talk. That's roughly 63% of our population are fully vaccinated. So uh, not great, but not bad, you know, pretty okay, middle of the road in terms of uh, other countries. Uh, but if you look, the vast majority of people above 65 uh, have been fully vaccinated, uh, which is great. So 88% of that population. So if you look at, uh, uh, oh, that's weird. Oh, there it goes. Sorry about that. So if you look at the world in terms of the total vaccine uh, doses given, there have been close to 10 billion doses of uh, vaccine given uh, throughout the world, which is, you know, obviously huge number. So we actually have a huge uh, advantage in, uh, in that so many doses have been administered in such a short period of time. Uh, and it gives us a unique opportunity to uh, study the vaccines as well as uh, any side effects or adverse events uh, from uh, the vaccine. So uh, incredible number of doses have been given out throughout the world. So let's talk about vaccine development and this can also be used for uh, drug development too. And how do we get how does a vaccine get to market? How does a drug get to market? They follow the same path. So this is usually the path. Uh, okay, so uh, first there are preclinical trials. So what that is, is uh, trials with, um, you know, usually uh, small mammals uh, to see if uh, the drug or the vaccine is uh, effective in that uh, population, whatever you're trying to study. So that's a preclinical trial. So once that's proven, then you move on to phase one. So what is a phase one clinical trial? So phase one clinical trial just looks to see is the vaccine or medication safe in humans and also what dose. So they'll try different doses to see which one has more side effects, which one has less side effects, things like that. Um, phase one, usually very, very, very small because uh, you're just looking at dosing and also, um, you know, are people safe? So after you finish phase one, then you move on to phase two. So phase two is, is, is what you're looking at effective and are there side effects now that you're giving it to more people. Again, phase two is still pretty small, maybe a hundred uh, uh, patients or so, maybe a little more, um, you know, a couple hundred, but still small, uh, still looking at whether it's effective and uh, or not. Then after phase two, you move on to uh, phase three trials. So phase three trials is just you, you have a control group, so this control group is getting uh, what's called a placebo, whether again, that's a fake vaccine or medication or like a sugar pill versus the control group, which is you know people that got the vaccine or the medication. Uh, and you try to random, uh, it's randomized controlled. So you're, you're, you're controlling the populations, you're trying to get rid of any variable uh, and it's much, much larger uh, than phase two clinical trials. And basically that trial looks at whether or not what you've been studying in smaller numbers actually does work when you bring it out to a, a larger population. Um, so that's a phase three clinical trial. When that's completed and then you've proven that this medication or vaccine works, then you move on to manufacturing. So the company will start making whatever it is uh, that uh, you are studying. And during that time, they'll also move for uh, approval. And then it gets approved, goes to market, and then there's post-market safety monitoring because now you're giving it to even more people. And occasionally things will crop up when you give it to more people than you saw in a phase three clinical trial. So that's how it works, okay? And usually 
um, you'll need to procure, I'm not usually, you need to procure funding. A lot of times you need to finish one phase uh, or, or phase one and phase two, and then get more funding to go on to phase three. So it's, it's a very stepwise uh, process. So it usually, and this says vaccine, but it's the same thing with medications, but we're focusing mainly on vaccine. This whole process in the past can, could take up five to 10 years because uh, it's a very time intensive process. So then what is this accelerated timeline that um, people have read about in the media and it has been discussed uh, specifically in regards to uh, COVID vaccines and uh, mRNA vaccines? So they still did the preclinical trials. Uh, so that was the same. And then um, they were able to do a few things that really accelerated the timeline. So the, the biggest one uh, probably is manufacturing. So all the governments uh, throughout the world um, got together and threw uh, a ton of money uh, at this problem in terms of developing a vaccine. Uh, and, uh, the previous administration had Operation Warp Speed here in the States. So, uh, so you had all this funding and, and they basically told companies, listen, just work on the vaccine. If it's a bust, it's a bust. We're still, you're still going to get the, the money. So companies now aren't afraid of um, losing out on, on, on all the money they've usually invested into developing uh, a medication or a vaccine. So because of that promise, the manufacturing started right away before we even knew that the specific vaccine uh, could work. They just, they started manufacturing it right off the bat. So they're not waiting for all the different phases of the clinical trials to finish. So that was a huge thing. The other thing was, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So a lot of problems with these phases is, and especially when you're studying vaccines more so than just medications is, you need to recruit people and then these people need to be exposed to the disease and then it's in order for you to figure out whether or not the vaccine works. And some diseases, they're, they're not, you know, as obviously as rampant as COVID-19. So when you're looking at a vaccine to say uh, chickenpox or, or pick a disease, you know, you have to follow these people for a longer period of time because they have to get exposed to it before you can figure out if it works. So that's, that's not a problem right now, obviously. Uh, so because of this um, huge population of infected individuals and people getting exposed to COVID-19, they were able to recruit people much, much faster. This also allowed them to overlap um, the clinical trials because they were getting the data at a much faster rate and were able to make uh, conclusions from this data far quicker than previously. So each phase of the clinical trial was still completed. And so and I, I want people to be assured that they were still all done, but because they were able to overlap them be, uh, due to the number of people, uh, they were uh, able to, to, to finish them much faster. In addition, um, you're not having to procure funding between one clinical trial and the next uh, phase of the clinical trial. So there's no waiting. So they're able to do uh, all of this quickly. And in the phase three clinical trials for just the two mRNA vaccines, there were 70,000 uh, people. So that's between Moderna and Pfizer. That is actually a huge number in terms of phase three clinical trials. Usually they're in the thousands, 70,000 is a, is a big number. And that's because there are so many people out there that they were able uh, to uh, recruit into these trials. Then you had the emergency use authorization, which then both uh, vaccines uh, eventually now have had uh, federal um, uh, FDA approval. Uh, and now since then, they've been doing the post-market safety monitoring, which is um, pretty common. So because of all of this, uh, the accelerated timeline took one to two years. So again, okay, you know, just to kind of summarize, because I think this is important and um, a, a big take home message is, 
they were able to do this in, in the one year because you had a significant amount of funding uh, from government institutions. So manufacturing started very, very early at the very beginning. So production started while trials were still in progress, which is not a norm previously. Um, and you did not need to secure funding between phases. And then unfortunately, it was a very large population with disease. So easy to recruit patients for trials. Uh, and you were able to overlap the different phases of the clinical trials, and you were able to demonstrate effectiveness of the vaccine at a much faster uh, rate. So those are all the reasons sort of in a nutshell of why uh, mRNA vaccines were able to be developed uh, so quickly. And there are other reasons too, which uh, I'm gonna talk about. So let's take a step back and discuss what is a vaccine So, and what is the purpose of a vaccine. So a vaccine is uh, typically a piece of a virus or bacteria uh, or the actual virus itself. And you introduce it to, uh, to a person uh, and that will trigger their uh, immune system to make antibodies that recognize said virus or bacteria. So if you encounter it uh, during your life, uh, you'll have uh, protection already set up uh, against it uh, to either prevent infection or prevent serious illness. So in the past, traditionally, these were the four different types of vaccines that we had. So you had what's called live attenuated, which is the actual virus, but it's been damaged or weakened in the lab uh, before it's administered. And an example of that is MMR, which is the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. You can have an inactivated one. So you have the virus and you kill it. That's usually what the, uh, the influenza vaccine is, the Delta influenza vaccine anyway. The kid one is a little different. So the influenza vaccine is an inactivated virus. You could have one that's, if, if a virus or a bacteria produces toxin, you can take that toxin, make it inert and introduce that. So tetanus is a very common uh, version of that. And then finally, it's called a recombinant protein. So protein is just, you know, a piece of, uh, it's not genetic code because that's DNA, but a protein is uh, part of the virus, whether it encodes for making an enzyme, but you, you take that and uh, introduce that. And that example of that is hepatitis B or the HPV uh, vaccine. So these traditional methods are time and labor intensive. You need to grow significant amounts of the virus to do this, like tons of the virus. Then after you grow the virus, you have to either kill it or, or damage it in some way. So that takes a ton of time, effort, resources. Uh, you need to, if it's a toxin, you need to isolate and deactivate the toxin. If it's a protein, you need to isolate the protein and then you have to manufacture more of the protein. And that doesn't even take into account like you're working with live pathogens in the lab. So you need a certain, uh, what they're called BSL lab to, to work with certain viruses, uh, depending on how dangerous they are. And you, you, you know, you'll need to transport these pathogens. So all this stuff uh, takes a lot of time uh, and effort. So again, another reason it would take vaccines a really, really long time to be developed. It's just the uh, technology that we've had available. But everything uh, changed with the mRNA vaccine uh, development. So taking a step back, what is mRNA? So mRNA is what's called messenger RNA. So uh, we have DNA. The DNA is the, our genetic code. Uh, and then the DNA can get what's called transcribed. Uh, into messenger RNA. And messenger RNA are very short snippets uh, of code that, that usually encodes for a protein or enzymes that our, our cells need. And uh, so uh, there's a molecule called the ribosome that will come in, it'll read that message or that code on the mRNA and then produce uh, the protein. Uh, these mRNAs are, are very transient, you know, they don't last a long time. Um, one, uh, one immunology professor was giving a lecture and, and I, I kind of liked 
how he compared it to. He compared it to the story function on Snapchat. Like it's there for a short period of time and then it goes away. Um, and that's really what mRNA is. So it doesn't last a long time in the cell at all. So, you know, this slide is a very busy slide and I will um, try to uh, guide you through it um, uh, in a nutshell. But um, it just shows you uh, how long uh, mRNA uh, technology has been in development. So first, it was discovered way back in 1961. So that's when we're like, oh, this molecule, this is mRNA. So that is when it was first uh, discovered uh, and uh, figured out what it was for. As early as 1978, uh, they proved that you could uh, introduce mRNA from one species to another species, and then it will still encode for the protein uh, from the original species. So. Uh, what they did is they took mRNA from a rabbit, put it into a mouse model, and they found protein uh, specific for the rabbit in that mouse model. But, and then they're like, after much time in development, they were like, oh, you know, uh, maybe we can use this to trigger uh, our immune system to respond and then create a vaccine uh, with this uh, method. Um, and before actually the 2000s, you know, I, I just want to let you know the first company that uh, was founded specifically regarding mRNA technology, whether that's used as therapeutics for cancer, that was the other big one, or vaccine was in 1997. So that's, they were already looking into this in the, in the 90s. And then in the early 2000s, uh, they figured out the big problem with mRNA is, as I mentioned, it, it dissolves very, very quickly, especially if you take a viral mRNA and introduce it to uh, a mammal, it, it dissolves very fast. So uh, they, it took a long time to kind of figure out how to stabilize uh, the mRNA. Uh, which they uh, eventually were starting to figure that out in the early uh, 2000s, so 2005 and 2008, a couple seminal papers uh, came out. Then they were trying to figure out how to how to package this, um, uh, and uh, that ended up being uh, fat particles that that they you know uh, put around the mRNA. Uh, uh, made that uh, molecule more stable, plus these fat particles uh, were charged in a way that it, it was able to attach to your cell's membranes, uh, and then the mRNA was able to get into the cell. So that took a long time to figure out. Uh, so once they were figuring this out, they actually were looking at uh, mRNA vaccines in 2012 uh, to uh, um, RSV influenza, uh, it's not listed here, but Zika is another virus they were looking at in terms of the mRNA vaccines as, as far back as 2012. Um, after 2012, it's not listed on this, but uh, in 2018, uh, an mRNA-based uh, therapy was approved. Uh, this was um, for a fairly rare disease or complications from a rare disease. Uh, but it was approved in, in the U.S. as well as in Europe in 2018. So that was the first uh, medication based on mRNA was approved before COVID-19. Um, and then, you know, 2020, uh, after all of this technology was being developed, you know, COVID, the pandemic hit and, and they said, hey, you know, what great timing. We just figured this stuff out. So let's, let's look at this for... Um, COVID-19. So, you know, most of the development went into the package and logistics and how to get it into the cell and keep the mRNA from degrading. So once these issues were resolved, it provided a method uh, uh, for us to use the mRNA vaccines. And the other great thing about um, the mRNA vaccines is that um, the way they're packaged. So it Took us a while to figure it out, but now we know it's mRNA. It's uh, fat uh, particles around it. 
or fat molecules around it. And then uh, essentially uh, sugar uh, um, uh, around that to stabilize it or, or what, are, what are called poly, uh, polyethylene glycol. So uh, that's, uh, that's it, that, those are the components. You don't need to add anything else. Some of these other vaccines that have been traditionally made, you needed to add what's called adjuvants or extra things uh, to either stabilize the vaccine or get it the immune uh, system to respond to the vaccine. For the mRNA, you didn't need any of that. So it's basically these three things and you don't need to grow anything. It's just totally based on a genetic code. Uh, so once you know what you want the mRNA to encode for, you just it's essentially plug in you take uh, so they have the uh, the um, the setup for COVID. Let's say there's another disease that comes in the future, uh, and it, it can work with the mRNA. All they all you have to do is remove the mRNA uh, portion of it that encodes for COVID nineteen, and just stick in the one for the next disease. So uh, this really could. Um, uh, well, it has revolutionized vaccines for COVID-19, but it could definitely revolutionize vaccines moving forward for other diseases. They have just started a trial with HIV. The first patient was just recruited uh, last week. So it can be used for other diseases. It can be used for uh, cancer therapeutics. I mean, this is revolutionary uh, to the point that there, um, you know, people are already discussing, experts in this field are already discussing that, um, you know, this is Nobel Prize worthy. Uh, some of the earlier research that was done 20, 30 years ago, those labs most likely will be nominated for the Nobel Prize at some point in the future. That's how revolutionary uh, this technology is. And as you can see, it didn't happen overnight. I mean, this dates back for 50 years, the discovery of mRNA, you know, 25 years to the first uh, company being founded. So, and this has been a very long process uh, that just, you know, just was st starting to finish off once uh, COVID hit. So, uh, so the common questions I get are, uh, Dr. Sarfal, I'm worried about side effects from the mRNA vaccines. All, all vaccines have side effects. Um, this is just looking specifically at uh, Moderna and Pfizer. Um, and as you can see, uh, an injection site reaction is the most common one. It happens about half the time. That's usually the sore arm that people get. Uh, tetanus is famous for doing that. Um, it can cause uh, fever uh, or headache or not feeling well. So uh, a, a lot of people do get that. Uh, but if you're looking at uh, side effects that are very, very dangerous that will make you seek out medical care. It's very low, um, as you can see uh, here. Uh, it's very, very low. Um, and we'll talk about the specifics for that. Um, so one that you may have heard the most about is myocarditis or pericarditis. So what is that? So that is inflammation of the heart, that's what it is, okay? Um, and uh, does it happen? Yes. It also seems to happen more frequently with the Moderna vaccine than the Pfizer vaccine. And it happens most frequently in a certain age group, usually young males, so 18 uh, to uh, 30. Uh, but when it does happen, vast, vast majority of cases are very, very mild and easily treated. Uh, usually you give what are called NSAIDs, uh, which are, you know, like ibuprofen, a leaf, things like that. Um, there have been a few cases here and there that have required uh, hospitalization. Um, so can people get sick from it, from the vaccine? Uh, unfortunately, yes, but it's, it's an extremely rare phenomenon. Uh, even with the highest number uh, from Israel, it says two out of 100,000 doses. So that's 0.00021% risk of this myocarditis from the vaccine. So very, very small. And the thing to keep in mind is the overall risk 
of this exact same problem with COVID is 0.146%. So if you look at the numbers, you are 70 times more likely to develop myocarditis with COVID-19 than with the vaccine. Now, some people argue, well, we don't know what the denominator is for COVID-19, meaning that you know a lot of people will get tested and it's not reported because they're doing home tests or whatever. So that that number, the denominator is actually a lot larger than what say the CDC is using. That's fine and it's probably true, but let's just say it is larger, you know, tenfold, twentyfold. I mean, the, you're still going to be far more likely to to get uh, the heart inflammation from COVID than you are from the mRNA uh, vaccine. Um, and, 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 and that's the take home point uh, is any side effect that you can get with the vaccine is magnitudes higher risk uh, from COVID itself. Um, so the other question we frequently get is, um, is the vaccine effective anymore? Case numbers are going up. So what's the point? Um, these are just some data from uh, the CDC COVID tracker, and it, it and you have to figure out how you define effectiveness, right? So there's effectiveness against infection, but the way I look at it is the point of the vaccine is to prevent severe disease and to prevent you from getting so sick that you need to seek out medical care or, or God forbid, be admitted to the hospital. So that's how I view it. So yes infections have gone up, but even if you're fully vaccinated, as you can see in this graph, the blue line, you're far lower than the unvaccinated. Uh, and, and that holds through all the age groups. So um, if you're unvaccinated, you're four times more likely to be infected than someone who is vaccinated. Now this is looking at hospitalizations. And as you can see, at least as of December, uh, if you were fully vaccinated, you were still pretty protected against hospitalization. So 80% uh, effective at preventing a hospitalization. And then finally, deaths. Um, if you're unvaccinated, you have a much, much higher chance of dying than uh, fully vaccinated. If you break it down by age group, yes, uh, the older you are, so 65 and older, that is the highest risk, but still, uh, even in the younger population, you are at more of a risk of dying from COVID if you're unvaccinated versus vaccinated. And if you look at the totality of it, <clears throat> you're 15 times more likely uh, to die uh, from COVID if you're unvaccinated. So again, the take home point, no vaccine, no vaccine is 100% effective in preventing infection. Um, <clears throat> vaccines, though, can provide protection against severe illness and hospitalization. So if you're vaccinated and you get COVID-19, yeah, yeah, you can get it, but you'll be sitting at home feeling, you know, cruddy, hope, you know, watching Amazon Prime or Netflix or whatever uh, at home. If you're unvaccinated, your, your chance of ending up into, in the hospital in the ICU and potentially dying from COVID, much, much higher. So that's the thing, you know, unvaccinated, I can get really, really sick and end up being in the hospital. Vaccinated, I can catch it, but yeah, you know, I'll feel lousy, but I'll be at home. And that's where, unfortunately we are in the pandemic. It's not a never get COVID or get the vaccines. You are going to be exposed to, or have been exposed to COVID. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to, the vaccine is trying to prevent you from getting very sick from it. Common question I get, Dr. Sarpelli, you know, I'm young and healthy. Why should I get the vaccine? Even if I get sick, it's like having a bad cold. Uh, what's the big deal? Uh, this is data uh, up until August, again, from the CDC, uh, basically looking at hospitalization rates. And they broke it down by age groups and vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And uh, even for the younger population, so 18 to 50, if you're unvaccinated, you're 14 times higher to end up in the hospital than someone who is fully vaccinated. So that's one reason, you know, uh, that uh, young people, even young people should get vaccinated. 
The other reason that I think kind of gets lost in all of this is what's called um, either post COVID syndrome or long haulers or long COVID. Um, you know, th this is becoming a really uh, uh, big problem among COVID survivors. So uh, I actually was just listening to a talk uh, this morning from uh, an expert that uh, runs a very large uh, long COVID clinic and is doing a ton of research into it. And he was suggesting um, at a minimum, 25% of people who've developed COVID, uh, uh, who had COVID will develop uh, long uh, COVID. So that's at least 25%. He thinks the number is actually gonna end up being higher, but that's 25%. And what is long COVID is people that have symptoms a month after they were initially diagnosed with COVID-19. So it's like headaches, fatigue, brain fog. If you already had weak lungs, you know, people will have uh, issues breathing, loss of taste, loss of smell. So that's a big deal. There are also other very rare complications uh, associated with COVID, even in younger, kid, uh, younger population in pediatrics. Uh, so that's mainly the inflammatory syndrome or multi-system inflammatory syndrome. It is very, very rare, uh, but it is a um, uh, very severe condition that can lead to severe illness, prolonged hospitalization, and even death. And there have been studies showing, at least pre-Omicron, that your risk of getting long COVID and your risk of getting this inflammatory syndrome are much, much lower if you've been uh, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Um, so a common uh, uh, issue is, you know, uh, people are pregnant and trying to get pregnant and they're worried about the effect of the vaccine uh, on, their, on their infant or, or on their fetus. So we know that people who are pregnant are at a higher risk of developing severe illness from COVID-19. We also know that if you're pregnant and you get COVID-19 uh, during your pregnancy, you're at a higher increased risk of preterm birth. To date, uh, there are, um, uh, there are uh, systems in place to monitor uh, pregnancy as well as post-pregnancy complications from medications as well as from vaccines uh, here in the States. And we have not seen, um, any issues with the vaccine uh, during pregnancy or, or uh, during breastfeeding. So there's no evidence to suggest that the vaccine can cause infertility, which is another uh, thing that was out there in the news media. In addition, if you are a breastfeeding uh, mother, um, if you get vaccinated, your immune system is gonna produce antibodies uh, to protect you from the virus. Now these antibodies will get passed on to your infant uh, through your breast milk, which is called passive uh, immunity. Uh, so, at, you know, and infants are obviously, uh, there isn't an approved vaccine yet uh, for those of that age group. So this passive immunity may actually help them as well. Uh, another common question that uh, we get is people who've already had COVID, um, who may have checked their antibodies, uh, they ask why uh, should they get the vaccine? Uh, full disclosure, I'm originally from Chicago, so uh, I can't help but uh, uh, throw a dig at uh, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> so, um, but let's look at previous infection versus uh, vaccination. Uh, vac we think that vaccine uh, induces greater antibody response, which on average lasts longer than antibody levels induced by infection. Uh, again, this is uh, stuff that came out in November, um, and data suggests protection from reinfection can last uh, only 90 days. Um, we also think that vaccination produces a, a wider breadth of response, meaning that it will probably be more protective against variants, and we're actually seeing that. If you had Delta, you were not protected against Omicron. Uh, the reverse isn't true. Omicron seems to be protective against other variants, and that is why it was able to take over uh, uh, throughout the world. But having Delta did not protect you from having Omicron. But if you were vaccinated, 
he did have some protection against Omicron. Uh, and um, uh, there was a study that came out uh, in November that said unvaccinated adults uh, with previous COVID-19 infection were six times as likely to be hospitalized versus fully vaccinated adults. I will say there was a, a report that came out a, a week or two weeks ago that made the rounds. Um, and it did suggest that if you've been exposed to uh, COVID before and you had COVID and you survived, you did have uh, protection against hospitalization and severe illness. Uh, and this is still being studied. I will point out that this was just during the Delta. So this is pre-Omicron and unfortunately every variant is teaching us something new. Uh, so will that hold through different variants? You know, I'm not sure. We have seen people in the hospital and I personally have seen people in the hospital that uh, this was their second time uh, getting COVID. Uh, so it may provide some protection. We're still trying to tease out. And then the other point, take home point is you had to have gotten COVID and then survived it. Hopefully you weren't that sick. Hopefully you didn't develop long COVID. Then you might have protection against other variants versus if you just get the vaccine, you don't have to go through all that other stuff. Um, in terms of antibody levels, uh, the honest answer is we don't, we don't know. There, there isn't a very good test for it. So there are many, many, many tests available uh, and many tests have EOA approval, uh, but they'll look at different types of antibodies. You can't use one test and compare it against uh, another test. The antibodies that they look at on the commercially available tests are totally different than the antibodies that labs look at to see uh, if the vaccine uh, is effective uh, or not. We also don't even know if the antibody levels indicate protection from further disease. And if they do, we don't know if there is a threshold. Uh, if you go back and look at the original studies, the antibody levels that uh, Pfizer and Moderna produced were like in the hundreds and even thousands. And the antibody levels that the Janssen and Janssen um, produced was like far, far, far lower. But when you looked at preventing hospitalization, the difference wasn't nearly that great. So we, we don't know if there is a certain level. The other thing to keep in mind is the immune system is very, very complex and there are other parts of it. So you know, your T cells are a very important part and, and we know they play a role in immunity uh, and there's no good way to measure that. So it's not just all about antibodies. So right now, unfortunately, we can't, there is no test that we can say, oh, your antibody level is this, you're good, you're good to go. There are those tests for other diseases and hopefully with more research, more time, uh, we will develop that for COVID. Trust me, as a physician, I would love to have that to be able to monitor antibody levels, but we just don't have a validated or good test um, for that. And then the last part is uh, boosters are what's being called uh, being up to date with your vaccine. So now everyone older than 12 is recommended to have one. Why the change? Cases were increasing at the time. There was data suggesting decreasing antibody response after six months, um, though rates of hospitalization didn't change. There was concern that Omicron or other new variants may be able to evade the original vaccine response. And uh, the vaccines, as I've shown, have overall been uh, efficacious and safe. So, um, this is uh, data from the COVID tracker looking at uh, cases uh, by vaccination status, so either fully vaccinated without a booster dose, fully vaccinated with a booster dose and the unvaccinated. If you look at just getting infections, um, there's a huge difference between unvaccinated and fully vaccinated and a statistically significant difference between uh, with and without the booster dose. If you're looking, um, at deaths, uh, that difference is very small between fully vaccinated with and without a booster dose, but I, both of them are far um, uh, better than uh, the unvaccinated. So compared to fully vaccinated adults with boosters, unvaccinated adults have much, much higher risk of infection and much, much higher risk of death. So you know, the goal is herd immunity. 
so th this is an example uh, on the left. It's um, a bunch of a population with no immunity. You know, the virus is red. It can spread quickly. Uh, population in the middle is partial vaccination. Uh, so the virus can still spread, maybe not as well as no immunity, uh, but still can spread effectively. And then if you develop herd immunity, uh, where the majority of the population uh, is vaccinated, then it stops the virus in its track. And if you happen to have a person who doesn't respond to the vaccine because of uh, medications or their immune system isn't good or they can't get it because of allergies or something, they're protected. So the goal is herd immunity. We're not there yet. Uh, you know, when we'll get there, uh, I don't think anyone is truly sure, but that is our goal. Uh, and I wanted to end before we get to the questions, um, some educational resources uh, if you're interested. If you're a numbers person and just want to see raw data, I would suggest going to the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. Uh, that They collect all the raw data from uh, all countries and post it. So those are the maps I showed. Um, uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia Vaccine Education Center website is run by Dr. Paul Offit, who is a world-renowned expert uh, in vaccines. Uh, and uh, he manages that website. A lot of good educational material, not just for COVID-19, but vaccines in general to all diseases. Uh, the American Net uh, Museum of Natural History has some nice animated videos um, specifically about COVID-19 and COVID-19 development. Uh, if you, someone who goes on YouTube, uh, some channels on YouTube that are pretty good, or if there's a TED-Ed talk on COVID-19 or vaccines are typically very good. Uh, the SciShow does a pretty good job of breaking down um, research uh, and, and really um, trying to distill it uh, into more uh, easily understood uh, terminology um, in terms of podcasts. Again, if you uh, are, are into data, the This Week in Virology podcast may be for you. It's run by PhDs, uh, people who have PhDs in virology, as well as immunology, and then they'll have uh, physicians as guests. Um, sometimes it can be extremely technical, but they do do a clinical update once a week uh, from a physician who's the chair of infectious disease at Northwell. And those are usually very good. Uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America puts out a podcast, as does the MMWR, in terms of weekly reporting. And then, again, uh, Science Versus is another one that um, tries to break everything uh, down. Um, so uh, those that is the presentation. And there have been some questions. Um, the And I'll let Dr. ask for... Uh, I've been talking a lot, so I'll let Dr. Asper take over some of the questions. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks, Dr. Charpel. I think that was a very informative overview. Uh, and uh, even I learned uh, quite a bit from, from your talk. Uh, I, there's two questions. Um, one is, uh, I'll take this one. It, it's, the question is, if, if this is safe with side effects rare, is it ethical to make someone take this against their will? Uh, if you are fine with getting COVID and fighting it with other options, why should I still get vaccines if I'm willing to take getting the risk of the virus? And this is a very uh, difficult uh, question. And a lot of us, like, you know, we, we don't like to be put in this situation that, well, you know, we're supposed to get a vaccine or, or not. But let me tell you uh, a, just the two quick little anecdotes that personalize this. So, you know, I have a uh, you know, a relative who has been wanting a hip replacement and uh, older, actually my aunt's husband. And, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, hobbling around, uh, you know, not able to. We know that when, you know, he's just severe arthritis in the hip. And when you have somebody like that, you know that doing a surgery like a hip replacement, which is considered an elective surgery, is important because, you know, otherwise they, they're not mobile. They can get pneumonia just because, you know, they, they pool their lung secretions and they don't move around. The quality of life is terrible. Well, his surgery has been postponed three times because of the hospitals are, are blocked, uh, full of 
of COVID. So the, that's one story. There's, there's lots of stories with people needing elective or semi-elective or actually necessary procedures, but that aren't super urgent, that even uh, people that need heart stents and things that you know they should be getting, but they're not getting because the hospitals are completely filled with COVID. And uh, I, I think there's public health people, I used to work at the World Health Organization, so I, I know how they think and, and messaging isn't always the best or hasn't been the best, uh, unfortunately. But uh, there's in, in public health, there's sort of an individual duty and then there's a duty to your neighbor. So, you know, if, if you're, uh, whether, you know, religion or not plays a role, but we all have a duty to our neighbor um, to uh, protect hospital capacity. And I think one of the, uh, you know, the thinking in public health has been, you know, we really need to, prevent our hospitals from getting overwhelmed and how do you do that uh, vaccinations. So, uh, you know, I'm not coming down on what's right or what's not right, just trying to explain some of the background. And uh, it's not always the, in the, you know, what's the, if you're talking about ethics and philosophy, is it uh, the ethics of an individual versus the common good? But, but think of your neighbors, think of people around you and that, um, you know, if, if one person thinks they have strong immunity, you may have a, a strong immunity, but we do know that certain people for various reasons are, are not able uh, to, they, they, don't, they don't have a good outcome when they, when they get um, uh, infected. So uh, I just had a patient who, uh, she had one dose of the vaccine, she has a kidney transplant, her husband, was healthy, uh, and they're both in their late 40s, uh, healthy except for he's overweight, and they both got Omicron. He died at home of a heart attack related to blood clotting from coronavirus. So we forget that not just the pneumonia, but it was blood clot clotting. She's still in the intensive care unit. Uh, she just had a breathing tube removed. So maybe that one dose of vaccine was, was helpful to her. but. You know, terrible story uh, could have been prevented with him being vaccinated. He's in his 40s. Uh, we've, we've seen this. It, it doesn't happen all that often, but we've also seen a lot of younger people. And I, I see uh, outpatients with long COVID, even high school students who, you know, like one day they were an A student, the next day, you know, couldn't remember their multiplication to do reasonably well on, the, uh, on their exam. So those are just some things to think about. Uh, the other yeah. part of, sorry, I was just going to jump Please, in the ahead. other part, um, in terms of your immune system being just as strong, I mean, it's an excellent question, and as I showed in one of the slides, there's some, uh, there is recent data that came out that, that suggested that if you're previously infected, um, you are protected against severe illness, uh, essentially at the same level as someone uh, who is fully vaccinated, so two doses. Again, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to point out that was before Omicron. Could things change with each new variant? It's certainly possible. We do know that um, a previous infection with the Delta virus did not protect against Omicron as well. So, um, so I don't. We don't know if that's going to hold up. So that's answering that one part of it. And then, uh, and you know, I understand. Um, you know, there is there is risk with the, the vaccine, um, but, uh, and as I tried to point out, the risk of getting COVID and having a complication from COVID uh, is, is far, far greater. I mean, logarithmic magnitudes greater of getting a complication from COVID versus getting a complication um, from uh, uh, the vaccines. A complication from the actual disease is much more likely than a complication from the vaccine. Uh, as, as Dr. Ashford mentioned, between right and wrong, that, you know, that's a very philosophical and ethical question. Um, and, um, you know, uh, what I like to just give all the information to the patients that I can. I'm not in the habit of telling my patients what to do or not do, uh, you know, this is what I would suggest doing. This is all the information that I know at this time 
you know, and and then try to make uh, use make the best decision. And the other problem, besides messaging, as Dr. Esper mentioned, is that uh, uh, there has been um, the pandemic keeps changing. Unfortunately, there are new variants. Uh, we're getting more data. Science is in, uh, imperfect. Uh, we keep learning more and more stuff every single day, so that's making us change our recommendations. So something we may have recommended six months ago may not hold weight now, and I think that's adding uh, to the messaging issue. Um, so that's that question. There was one qu question that we got before the presentation I want to make sure we answered was about timing of the booster. After, if someone got COVID, when should they get the booster? So. Uh, you can get it after you're out of quarantine and feeling better. So uh, the party line most people tell you is 10 days. Um, after you contract COVID, you can get the, the booster. Um, in reality, uh, you are probably pretty well protected for at least the first 30 days. Um, and theoretically, you might have a bigger response to the vaccine uh, if you got it uh, closer to when you had the COVID-19 disease. So if you wanted to wait 30 days, you know, that is probably fine. Uh, but the party line is, is 10 days. But I, I don't think anything's going to happen between day 10 and day 30. And uh, the likelihood of you having probably uh, less uh, um, side effects from the vaccine will diminish uh, over over time. So that was one. And then there is uh, a question about boosters um, every six months. You know, I, we don't know. I mean, the answer is we don't know. Um, and it also depends on what you're looking at in terms of effectiveness of the vaccine. So and what's important to society. So is are we trying to prevent infections or are we trying to prevent severe illness uh, urgent care visits, hospital visits, uh, and hospitalizations. So it depends on what you're looking at. If you're trying to prevent severe illness, then you're probably not going to need boosters nearly as frequently um, because we know that even if you've only received two doses, you're still pretty well protected against hospitalization. If you're trying to prevent infection, that's a different story, then you're going to need boosters more frequently. What's the right answer? I think that is um, depending on what uh, the community decides, and, and that may be different for each country. So that will determine how often you'll need to get boosters. You know, I tend to look at preventing severe illness and hospitalization. Um, so I think that's what's the most important thing, um, not uh, preventing someone from testing positive. And I think this may change and is already starting to change. Uh, most places aren't looking at case counts anymore. What they're looking at is uh, hospitalizations from COVID, what is the hospital capacity, and um, you know, how many people have died from COVID. Uh, a lot of people are shifting towards that. So I, I think that's probably going to be the driver, and that will determine how often we need uh, boosters. Um, uh, there's another question that, that, yeah. that came in uh, about uh, from an employee. My wife is constantly in contact with COVID patients. She's a, a nurse. We're both vaccinated, wondering, uh, I have been around her when she, ha when she has had COVID, along with others who have had it and haven't uh, caught it at all. You know, my daughter's school, for example, is a major outbreak of, of COVID, but she, she's vaccinated. She has not uh, gotten COVID. Uh, we've been testing her every day for the past uh, week and a half. And some people, you know, as, as the data that Dr. Sarpel showed, you know, uh, there is still protection against infection from vaccines. So you're still protected. There is some protection, significant protection against getting it. Much You have a much lower chance of getting it if you're vaccinated than unvaccinated. But some people, but even if they're boosted, will still get it. Uh, and we don't know why that is, but some people react better to the vaccines than, than others. But just about everybody uh, has that gets the vaccine has protection against severe illness. And, and that's, uh, that's great. And uh, you can- so, and Just can I- oh, Please. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna do another anecdote. So um, my <clears throat> wife uh, contracted COVID uh, back in October through work. She's also a physician. 
uh, she was vaccinated. We weren't boosted at the time yet because I was I was still early on. Um, you know, I'm vaccinated. She's vaccinated. She got sick, um, and we she ended up getting tested through her hospital, and she tested positive. You know, I made the decision to not quarantine, and we have a smaller house. Um, I'm vaccinated. She's vaccinated. I was like, you know, the chances of me getting it from her are probably very small because we know that people who are vaccinated shed less virus, um, especially, you know, they may have a lot maybe on day one, and then it just drops quickly. So by the time she got diagnosed, she had been sick for 24 hours. I said, well, you know, I'm vaccinated. The amount of virus she's shedding is probably low. I'm, I'm fine. Um, and I didn't get sick and I did, you know, I still had to go to work. So I was doing, you know, tests uh, pretty much the first four days and, you know, I never got it. So uh, it's, a, it's a good question. We don't understand all the dynamics, but as Dr. Esper said, we definitely think that people who have been vaccinated shed less virus. So they, therefore, we think that they may not be able to transmit it as equally, uh, as efficiently. But again, you know, why do some people who are relatively healthy, who've been boosted, contract COVID versus other people? I mean, we, we don't know the answer uh, to that, unfortunately. Uh, I, I will also add, if your wife is a nurse, give her a kiss. Uh, she, she, she needs all the support she can get, uh, at working in, in, uh, hospitals. It's, it's been, uh, uh, it's been tough. I will also say that, you know, I think, uh, public health authorities are cognizant of not, you know, not jumping to keep recommending booster after booster after booster, but, you know, it might be that, uh, that we'll require an annual booster or every two years, we'll have to see. There's, you know, yeah. nobody wants to get, uh, vac give vaccines unnecessarily, and we're certainly not advocating that. But for all the reasons that uh, Dr. Sharpell mentioned, uh, again, it's, it's, a great, it's a great idea to get vaccinated. You're doing uh, something for yourself, and you're also doing something uh, for your, your neighbor. I mean, a lot of us have had, uh, you know, uh, uh, us, we doctors have seen many younger people die of COVID, uh, which is, you know, horrible and uh, avoidable. And uh, we think we have a strong immune system, but uh, you know, there's it's not necessarily a strong immune system uh, that that will protect you because if you have probably if you have you know, a certain genetic trait, you're either susceptible to long COVID or uh, or you might get severe COVID. Uh, I, I have a cousin in Huntsville, Alabama, who, you know, right before vaccines came, avail came available in uh, early January, she, uh, she passed away uh, with COVID uh, at 54 years old, uh, otherwise, otherwise healthy. So it, it happens uh, and it's, it's not uh, something that, uh, we like to see it's it's preventable and and going forward i think that uh you might have heard what the governors were talking about opening up society again i think that uh restrictions will uh, on gatherings etc uh, will and and should be uh loosened gradually uh as you know again as hospital capacity uh, is improving uh quickly now with uh, uh omicron uh sort of waning slowly, but still lots of hospitals are in, in the country are still quite full and, and staff is burnt out. And uh, it's, it's tough finding enough nurses uh, and doctors to, to work in uh, a lot of places now. It looks like there was one other question about timing of boosters. So if you've had the mRNA vaccines, so either Pfizer or Moderna, uh, the booster is five months uh, after your second dose. Um, if you've had the J and J, it's um, two months uh, after your J and J. There is a very small percent of the population who uh, have had like organ transplants or on medications that affect their immune system. Those people actually, their primary series to be fully vaccinated is actually three doses, not two. 
and then they get a fourth dose. Um, but they're the only uh, group of people that should be getting more than three shots at this time. Again, things may change. So um, I know that uh, Israel is giving out fourth doses to their population. You know, that's been reported. I mean, I think they're ahead of the science, to be honest. I mean, there's no data suggesting a fourth dose is needed. They've shown that antibody levels go through the roof with the fourth dose. But again, what does that mean? I have no idea. Um, and, you know, antibody levels aren't the be all end all of protection. Um, so, you know, at this time, unless you're a very, very, very specific population, I would not necessarily recommend a, a fourth shot. I think those are all the questions I see in the chat room. So, um, so well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, you know, uh, Kim Foster has our email. If you think of a question and you want to email it to her, she can forward it to us and we'll try to answer it. Uh, otherwise, thank you for joining. I hope uh, you learned something and um, uh, best of luck, everyone. Thank you, everybody.